Good morning. Welcome to Melville on this Trinity Sunday. It is good to be together to worship God. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against their enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. Let us worship the triune God. Let us pray. Creator, we praise you. Through your word and spirit, you created all things. You reveal your salvation throughout the world by sending us your son, Jesus, the word made flesh. Through your spirit, you give us a share in your life and love. Fill us today with the vision of your glory that we may always serve you and praise you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Would you join me in our prayer of confession? Holy, 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 Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we love you, though we struggle to fully comprehend you. We follow you, though we don't know where you might take us. We praise you, though we see only glimpses of your glory and wonder. We trust you, because you are worthy of our belief trust and faith. Yet we admit that there are times our love, obedience, praise and trust leave much to be desired. Too often our love's only a passing feeling and not a lasting action. We obey only when it's convenient. Our praise is limited to when things are going well and our trust is more in ourselves than in you. Forgive us and call us back in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Apostle Paul reminds us that we did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back in fear, but have instead received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. This is the good news by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we are all forgiven. Thanks be to God. Our responsive reading is Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders. Thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon be like a calf, Syria like a yellow The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert of The voice of the Lord twists the oak and strips the forest bare. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. As we come to hear the word of God, let us pray. Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, you invite us to be in community with you and with each other. You rescue us, redeem us, and make us whole. Inspire us with these words of scripture, your transforming word of life. May it deepen our faith, comfort us, and challenge us, so that we may grow in our love for you and each other in the name of Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Today we thank Lucy for sharing with us the Word of God. Our first scripture this morning is from Isaiah chapter 6, 1 to 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraph, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doors posts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, <clears throat> for I am a man with unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongue from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And the Gospel reading this morning uh, is from Romans uh, chapter 8, starting at verse 12. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if, you, but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received a spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. May the Lord bless our understanding of his holy word. Grace and peace to you from our triune God in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's amazing how often and how familiar that phrase is to many of us. Um, it, for some of us, it'll feel very traditional and outside of the ordinary of what phrasing we might use here, and yet it has been a greeting in the church for years and years and years. And I think sometimes we use that statement without really understanding how huge of a statement it is. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one, one in three, creator, redeemer, sustainer, Alpha, Omega, beginning and end. We have so many amazing words to describe God. Uh, none of them quite do it on their own, but the list goes on and on as people have tried. We, Abba, Father, Adonai, Master, Ancient of Days, Mighty, Everlasting, Elroy, the God who saves, El Shaddai, God Almighty, Healer, Shepherd, Sabaoth, God of Hosts, Logos, the Word, the lists go on and on and on, and those are just the biblical foundations for the names of God. Countless ways of describing that which is ultimately indescribable. So this first Sunday after Pentecost is Trinity Sunday. As we tell the story of our faith in chronological order, this makes sense. Now we've got the Holy Spirit with the church after um, Pentecost, so now we have uh, the Trinity, which has always been here, but as we, we organize ourselves around time, this is how we get to Trinity Sunday. But instead of tying ourselves in knots trying to sort out the math of the church, uh, how three can be one and one can be three, today's reading from the prophet Isaiah invites us to delve into the mystery uh, of God, the mystery of the God that we worship, the God who created us, the God who saves us, 
the God who sustains us, the God whose majesty is so great that it can only be glimpsed in small pieces by us mere mortals. So Isaiah was a prophet, and this is the moment here in chapter 6 where God calls him to speak to a people who hear but never quite understand, who see but never quite perceive, a people who are very much on a downward spiral away from God, and the result of that is going to be not only away from God, but away from everything they know. We're not in exile yet, but Isaiah sees it coming. The main purpose of a prophet is not so much to tell the future, but to interpret the past and to be that, that early alarm system, that warning bell, that this will happen unless you change what you're doing. So in the book of Isaiah, everything leading up to this, so in the first five chapters, we get what is more or less the equivalent of an ancient Eastern lawsuit, which indicted the people of Judah for their sins and justified the punishment that would follow, namely exile. In the year that King Isaiah died, he starts, and this tells us a lot more than the year. The year is actually irrelevant. Instead, this is a signpost, a marker that sets the scene for readers who will understand that this is a turning point for God's people. This is a historical hinge that shakes them to their core, not unlike the shaking of the thresholds and the doorposts that we hear about in Isaiah's vision. In many ways, King Uzziah was remembered as being the best, or at least the most stable king since Solomon. The people enjoyed a period of great prosperity. He was wise and capable. He reigned for decades, starting when he was 16. And as long as he made it a point to seek God, God made him prosperous. He was well respected. However, as is so often the case and why earthly kings failed Israel time and time again, authority and power went to Uzziah's head and he, like so many before him, lost sight of God's sovereignty. He went so far as to deem himself important enough to enter into the temple and to burn incense himself, an offering, which doesn't seem like that big of a deal to us who are free to come and worship. But at that time, only the priests were able to do that. Even though he was the king, he did not have the right or the authority to be at the Lord's altar. And yet his pride led him to see himself as being above the law maybe even on par with God. And he was immediately struck with leprosy and isolated until the time of his death. So the people find themselves at his death at a critical juncture. Disaster is on their doorstep. Assyria was threatening invasion. And even though Uzziah's son Jotham governed in his place, the steady direction that had been enjoyed for such a long time was gone, and the world as they knew it started to fall apart. Jotham's son was King Ahaz, who is remembered as an evil king, and that his reign is where things really fall apart. But we're ahead of ourselves. Isaiah's vision comes at this pivotal time for Israel, that almost but not yet, that maybe there's time to turn this around, opportunity that is so often missed with the prophets, Isaiah's vision comes at this hinge moment in the year that King Uzziah died. And Isaiah says this, I saw the Lord, nobody sees the Lord, but Isaiah saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs, angels, were in attendance above him. 
burning figures in some translations. In the Old Testament, we always get fire with, when the Lord appears, when, that, when the Lord is in human realm and understanding. Each of these seraphs had wings. With two, they covered their faces, and with two, they covered their feet, and with two, they flew. One called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. At their voices, everything shook and the house filled with smoke. Isaiah was awestruck and terrified. He said, woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt is departed and your sin is blotted out. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah, seemingly forgetting his momentary sense of unworthiness earlier, being set free from that by God's action, says, Here I am. Send me. Even when the world is falling apart all around us, even in moments when we couldn't possibly feel sorrier for ourselves or more helpless or more uncertain, Isaiah's vision assures us that God is still on the throne. When earthly kings and powers fail, the King of kings and the Lord of lords is immovable, sovereign, over all. That's Isaiah's vision, and through it, we are invited into the majesty and the holiness and the unknowable reality of God. And that's the very thing that Isaiah failed to do. His pride led him to consider himself above the law, maybe even equal to God. And instead of honoring God who had enabled him to have such a solid and prosperous reign, Isaiah sought to elevate himself even further, thinking that he had earned it himself. He wanted to elevate himself beyond the reach of human ability and reality, which never works out well, no matter how many times we try. Isaiah, through his vision, invites us to reflect on the transcendence of God. And if you're a little foggy around the definition of the word transcendence, don't worry, you're halfway to the definition already. The literal translation from the Latin root more or less means beyond climbing. The roots are beyond and to climb. In other words, transcendence is that which exists beyond which is climbable that which exists beyond ordinary limitations, beyond what humans can physically get to, beyond our, phys our physical needs and realities, that is where God is. It, God transcends our human experience. So on Trinity Sunday, we are invited not to work out exactly how God is three in one and one in three, but to wonder at a God who was and is and will still be, even though we can't understand it. Isaiah's vision begins with this overwhelming image of God's majesty. The Lord is seated on a high and lofty throne, and the hem of his robe fills the temple, just the hem. The place where God resides on earth with the people that whole massive place which was built can contain only the hem of God's robe. There is no better way to describe the hugeness that is God. I could not even find a good word for it. So you get hugeness today. The grandeur and the sovereignty of God is so great, so big, that God's presence on earth can only be represented by the hem of his robe. Just picture that. It wouldn't make a very good stained glass window. <laughs> and yet how amazing is it to wonder at a God who is that big? 
Even the angels, the seraphim, know it. They veil their faces. They cover their feet in the presence of God's all-consuming holiness. They cry, holy, holy, holy. The very reality that King Isaiah missed, the very thing that we so often miss, forms the basis for Isaiah's ministry and shapes his call to speak to a people who hear but don't listen, who see but don't understand. Holy, holy, holy. There is no way to describe our God because our God is beyond our understanding. The unknowable nature of God is a theme that runs throughout scripture. And we are reminded that while we can know God, we can never know him fully. We know God in the way that only the hem of God's robe fills the temple, and that forms the basis of our worship. And Isaiah's response to the vision is not that surprising. People do not just see God, and so he is immediately filled with humility and fear. He knows that he has no business being in God's presence, no business looking upon the majesty and wonder of the Holy One. He is unworthy. What is he doing here? And this is, or should be, a common human reaction when confronted with the divine. Our limitations and our imperfections, those things about us that we usually like to hide in the back corner or stick a lid on to make ourselves look better, those things become starkly highlighted against this backdrop of God's perfect holiness. And instead of being honest with ourselves, we tend to try and reduce God to something that we can hold and understand instead of as Isaiah shows us, owning what we are. And what happens next is unexpected, but it sets the stage for everything that is to come. Isaiah's prophetic ministry is a combination of these stark reminders of impending judgment, which does come to pass, filled with promises of hope and grace. The same hope and grace which here is granted to Isaiah in his moment of despair, in his awareness of his own sinful nature, they take Isaiah's lips with a live coal, they touch him, and they declare that his guilt has been removed and his sin has been atoned for. And not only for Isaiah, but a symbol of God's redemptive work throughout history, even up to Jesus on the cross. It's not something that Isaiah does for himself. It's not something that he could do for himself. He didn't wake up that morning and say, I am going to become blameless in order to see God. God made him blameless. It is something which only God can do. And it comes when Isaiah humbles himself before the Lord and acknowledges God's glory and accepts God's sovereignty. So much so does he recognize God's sovereignty that he says he's not even worthy of praising God in his current state. He's not even worthy of joining in that praise hymn that the seraphim are singing. But God declares otherwise. And God declares otherwise for us as well through Jesus. There is hope and possibility, redemption and restoration. On Trinity Sunday, we celebrate the mystery of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Isaiah's vision isn't explicitly Trinitarian, though we get some of the greatest Trinitarian hymns from it, but it invites us into that wonder, that the wondering at that complex and rich nature of God as God reveals himself to us the Father's sovereignty, the Son's atoning work, and the Spirit's sanctifying presence, they all play a role in our understanding of who God is, even though our understanding is oh so very small. We are drawn into the awe-inspiring, unknowable reality of God, and we are challenged to recognize our need for God, to recognize the majesty and grandeur of God, beside our small human reality. 
As we celebrate this Trinity Sunday, may we be ever mindful of the majesty, the holiness, and the mystery of God. And may we be inspired to live out our faith with reverence and dedication. Let us pray. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. We stand in awe of your majesty and holiness, O Lord. Cleanse us, forgive us, and send us forth by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Triune God, we adore you for your threeness and your oneness, a holy mystery. We are in awe of that same unfathomable mystery which is reflected in creation around us, in the complexity of living things, in the birth of a child, in your work in our lives, for the ways that you equip us and call us to say yes, for the many gifts that you give us through your Holy Spirit. Lord, so often we hear your call or feel your nudge in our lives and are not sure what that might look like. And yet you enable us, you urge us to say, yes, here I am, send me. Our experience of your presence is different from neighbor to neighbor, friend to friend, even in different periods of our lives, and yet, God, you continue to be with us, transforming us, redeeming us, and restoring us. Your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are greater than our thoughts. So although we acknowledge that we do not always understand your ways, we continue to offer you our prayers for creation and for its care, for places affected by nat natural disaster, for farmers who are anxious about this year's crops, for places suffering from drought and famine, for those watching their futures washed away in floods, for all those who watch the climate and the rising waters and who are anxious about the future. Lord, call us to account as stewards of this earth. Help us to be faithful in the way that you call us to care not only for ourselves and for each other, but for every living thing. We pray for the nations of the world, for places of conflict and violence, for places where people suffer under oppressive regimes, for places in this world where it is dangerous to be a child, to be a woman, to have a certain faith, a certain sexuality, Lord, we pray for our nation and its leaders, for our community and for those in authority. We pray that you would bring your wisdom, that we might join in calls for peace and justice, that we would recognize those places where we are complicit in action or inaction. We pray for the church universal as we continue to listen and discern your call, as we continue to act in your name and to worship you for the many ways that you are present even still. We pray for our church here and for the ministry that you have given us. May we continue to look out into our neighborhood, into our city and into the world to see the ways that you are calling us to act and respond. We pray for those who are sick in mind, body, and spirit, those known to us, those known only to you. Lord, hear our prayers as we pray in the silence of our hearts. 
All these things we offer in the name of our triune God, three in one, one in three from eternity to eternity. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.